Good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to share, you know, the future of FileMaker Cloud, and I'm here joined with by Herring Cheng, is a director of engineering for FileMaker Cloud DevOps and Server Engineering. So you heard us on the visionary keynote, and we gave you an um, overview of what uh, we are planning to do on the FileMaker Cloud on the console. And so I'll go ahead and start and talk about today's agenda. So we'll, I'll do a recap from the visionary keynote and then do a recap of the purchase and the deployment, talk a little bit more deep dive actually today, uh, give you a deep dive on the FileMaker customer console, followed by FileMaker ID, um, and then have Herring present the architecture, and then we will open it up for, uh, talk about the roadmap, and then open it up for Q&A. So let's get started. Okay, I guess by now we are all familiar with the two-prong strategy. So we'll keep, FileMaker is very important to us, and we'll keep investing in FileMaker, modernizing it with web, mobile, and cloud. And the second is we will also invest in the other new products like Claris Connect and the next-gen platform. So for today's session, we're going to focus on the first one, which is the FileMaker platform and how we are going to, you know, investing in the cloud and what's our, the, as a cloud-first strategy. So we've already seen that we have three products now, so we have evolved just from the FileMaker, file, just from the custom apps FileMaker, now we have the Claris Connect for the integrations, and then we are also working on the next gen for the workflow apps for creating those digital experiences. So starting with the agility and speed, I repeat from um, our earlier session, as a cloud-first strategy, you want your instance to be up and running as soon as possible so that you can deploy and continue using your application. And we're going to see how we have really simplified the purchase and deployment process. So let's say you're going to visit the FileMaker store to purchase the product, and as you can see here, what we have now done is we only have two buckets. So you will select the number of users and the length of the subscription. And when I say two buckets, meaning you the first one is your 5 to 99 users that you can select from. And if it's above 99, you will call sales. Now, compared to 1.x, you had multiple tiers. So that's how, you know, one of the things we have done, if you were a customer in the 1.x, if you're using, you'll see that this has been really simplified. Now, once you select the users and the length of the subscription, you will continue with the checkout. And it is during this checkout where we are going to ask you about creating your FileMaker ID. And I'll go deeper into the FileMaker ID, but for now, it'll go ahead and you know enter your username, uh, set up your email, password, and you will see uh, in a couple of slides below that how this FileMaker ID will tie up your license, subscription, user, uh, solutions, and it will really make it easy to manage everything under the same hood, just with one ID. So we'll talk more about that. So once you set up the FileMaker ID, then you, then you can set up your multi-factor authentication, which is optional. So you can set up that once you do so, you will come back to your bill to and license to page. And here, what you will do is, one of the things that I want to point out is, uh, your bill to and license to can be two different users. Now, when you fill up your bill to and license to, we will see that in the FileMaker customer console that a role gets assigned to the person, whoever fills out the bill to and license to. So that will be a team manager role. And you will also select what the organization or the team name when you fill up your bill to and license to information. So once you do that, 
you will come to the payment and order confirmation. So we'll continue with the checkout. And once you submit the order, behind the scene, spinning up of your instance is already in progress. You will receive an order confirmation number, and your instance spinning is already in progress. And then you will receive, in just a couple of minutes, you will receive an email with a link to your FileMaker customer console. And at this point, your instance is up and running. So this is really, I would say, like a magic. We have really simplified the whole thing. We are doing the whole heavy lifting. And uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy the experience. So now you're going to accept the EULA terms. And once you do so, you will apply. You are have apply for the preferred host name. So we give you now an option to prefer uh, the apply for the preferred host name, which is basically your link to your uh, FileMaker customer admin console. And this is the host name for your um, uh, server domain also. And of course, the clients can connect to it as well. So now. Once you do that and you have submitted, you will land in the FileMaker Customer Console homepage. And as you can see on the top, I am a team manager there. So there are two roles here. That's basically two roles. One is the team manager, and the second is your license to license user. And we'll talk about this ro role more later. So you see. In the dashboard, you can see we have a couple of tabs here. One is yours to start, to start with. Is, this is the home page. Then you have the users. You will have the groups. You have the host, settings, and subscription. And we'll go over each of these tabs. Now, what you can do here is you can actually collapse the banner here. And if you do so, you can see all the files, all the custom apps that are listed here. You can also launch your custom app in Pro and WebDirect from here. And the other thing that you can do is if you are a member of a multiple teams, you can switch teams here, and then your view changes. So from the FileMaker Customer Console, this is one place, everything under the same hood. You can change your view. Just choose the team you, want, you are part of, and then you can see the relevant information for that team. Moving on to the users, when you come to the Users tab, you will see all the users that are part of this subscription, this license. And it is really easy. From here, you can invite users to your team. Now, it's really easy to invite users. You, all you have to do is put in their name, la first name, last name, and your, their email ID. And when you do that, they'll get an email. Uh, and you will see the user uh, listed uh, with a pending status, invitation pending. Once they ac accept it, you will also get a notification. Now, when you invite the user, you have the option here to assign the role. Do you want that user to be a team manager, or do you want them to be a licensed user? Now, for a, if the user is a and as you can see, we have two check boxes here, which means uh, it, it's a either or, and they can have both the roles. Or you can take away, I mean, can just uh, invite the user without assigning any role. So one of the things, other things that I want to mention is uh, on the when I when I myself purchased uh, the license and became a team manager, if I bought a five-user license one of the license was already consumed by me. So I will have four licenses left. So when I am inviting another user, then another license, when after he accepts, he or she accepts, then another license will go down. And you will see the count here that it has gone down to three. And you can also withdraw the roles as, and as a team manager, it's basically you have more control on the environment. So with that said, the next one is groups. So if you have 
say, multiple teams in an organization and you really want to structure them, uh, this is the place where you can create groups and structure, uh, structure them. Like, for example, if you have a HR or a marketing, so on. So you can structure users under groups. Next is the host. So this is your link, as I was mentioned earlier, to your uh, domain. And it takes you to your uh, customer admin console. Now, we do have the customer admin console as separate now from where you know you can view the dashboard, you can see all your um, uh, data API information, the server-related information, so your solution-related information. But in the future, we are, going to, we are planning to merge these two very soon. So there will be on, only one, and you will see in the roadmap, only one console. So your FileMaker customer console will be one unified console. You can manage everything from FileMaker customer console. And we are already working on it. Moving on to the settings. So under settings, what you could do here is that's what, like the, as I am a team manager, I have more control, as I was mentioning earlier. So I can allow or disallow like change in the FileMaker ID. For example, I can change, allow you to ch ch allow my team member to change their email address. Like, and I can also uh, allow or disallow transfer in and out of my team member from my team to the other. So I can do that. And I can also have, I also have the option whether I'm going to allow them to download FileMaker Pro. So that's on the top. So there are some of these settings that I can control as a team manager. And then on the subscription tab, as you can see, it gives you a dashboard view of you know, the license information, the data API, your cloud compute. In this case, we have a medium. And then what you could do is you can actually, there is a link button on the top, link on the top that says update your subscription. So when you do that, now I'll show you, you have the option to change your users, your compute, your storage. So when I go there, and you also have all the license related information up here. Now when you click on this, you come to the store, back to the store, where you can modify your users, your compute. Now, what we have done is we have actually tied, tied up the users to the compute. So for example, your five to nine users is tied up to a medium compute. Now, if you increase the number of users, say, for example, you move on to 12 or 13, we will automatically change the compute to a large. And it will going to be reflected in the price. So I want to wrap up the, this particular section by saying that we have really simplified the purchase process here. We just have two buckets. One is your five to nine, nine users, and, the, uh, and five to 99, and above that you will call sales. And now with just few clicks, you can get your instance up and running. And also that means a rapid deployment. And then you have this unified FileMaker customer console view from where you can manage everything. And one other thing that I want to mention is uh, regarding uh, inviting your uh, members or inviting your team members is when you invite the team members to join your team, they need to create their FMID. So when I sign up or when I'm purchasing the product, then I create my FMID the first one. The second workflow is when you are inviting somebody to join the team, that person must have the FMID. So as I was mentioning earlier, that you will see as I progress through that the FMID is going to connect your like, uh, tie up your license. It's going to link the users. It's going to link your solutions. So every team member that's joining the team needs to have the FMID. And what we have, and this is also in relation to uh, in-market cloud today, which is FileMaker Cloud for AWS. So as you can think about it right now, what we have in the cloud 1.x, that 
we have got feedback that customers have to understand the various terminologies of AWS. What is cloud formation? What is an instance? So we have taken all that away, right? We are doing the heavy lifting. We have simplified the purchase process. We are tying everything up with your FMID. And now it's just few clicks for you. So that's a huge leap for our FileMaker Cloud. Next is backup. So we will continue doing backups every 20 minutes, as we were doing in 1.x. But one of the difference that we had in 1.x versus in 2.0 is your restoration. So in 1.x, we used to have, you have to have the entire snapshot restored. But now you can see individual files with timestamp, and you can restore any individual file. So that's the change we have done. And then we have incremental uh, backups too. I'd like to talk about uh, some of the key things in the trial, expiration, and renewal. So when you are in the trial period, or when you are almost close to the renewal, we will send you both notifications. So you, can, you will receive notifications uh, in your customer console. But on top of that, you will also receive email. So there are, we, these are the uh, timestamps that we have, like seven days, three days prior to the expiration for the trial, that you will receive notifications and email. Same for the renewals. So you will receive notifications and email that gets kicked off 15 days prior before the renewal period, before the time gets, uh, time expires. So 15 days, three and zero. Now 30 days prior to the expiration, when you get into the customer console, you will see a button that says renew. So that will appear 30 days before expiration. And then it's kind of a reminder that you need to renew your license. So on top of that, obviously, we are going to send you the notifications uh, in, inside the console and the email. Now, say you did not renew and your license expired, you still have three days grace period. Now, say you didn't do that either. What happens is we are going to shut down the server. Now, we give you 45 days time to actually download your solutions. And after 45 days, we are going to wipe out the data. So in that 45 days, what you have the option is, if you come back to your console, you can see in the FileMaker, the FCC console, you will see a temporary retrieval request link. When you click that, you will go to your customer admin console, and from there, you can download the solution. And when you click that link, what we do behind the scene is bring up the server. And you will have four hours to download the solutions. And say you didn't do that, then we will shut it, and shut it down again. And then you, will always, you can have that 45 days time period to come, come back anytime and click that link, start up the server, and then download your solutions. But after 45 days, we are going to wipe the data. Herring, do you want to add anything to it? You're doing perfectly. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so now the next thing is applying FMID to existing solutions. So if I want to recap, we talked about how the two workflows. The first, when you purchase the license for the first time, you have to create your FMID. Second, anytime any member joins the team or the group, they need to create the FMID. That's the second workflow. And this is the third workflow, that if you want to upload your uh, solutions or share it, you need to apply uh, the FMID to the existing solutions. And what I'll just do a quick walkthrough here is how do we share solutions with groups, our teams, uh, from Pro. So you'll go into the managed security. And if you have already bought the FileMaker Pro for the cloud, you will be creating your uh, FMID. And even in the launch center, you will see the link for the FMID creation. So 
Given that their FMID is already created, so you'll go to the managed security. Once you do that, you will see, just like any other Active Directory, you will see the list for the FMID for Anna's team shop. That's the team already. So you'll select that FMID, and you can have multiple teams, because now you're sharing your app. Before you do so, you have to pick up the group for that FMID. And once you pick up the uh, team FMID, and once you do that, you will click on the new button, and then you will apply the user or the groups for that particular app ID. So now here, what you will see here on the right side drop down is you will see all the users and groups that you can select for to share the app with. If there is none listed, then the small icon next to the new account, when you click on that, it will take you to the cloud. And in cloud, you will create your groups in users, as I was showing in the FCC, the groups tab. Once you do that, then they will appear here. And then you can select the group or the users you want to share with. And once you do that, you will assign the privilege set. So then here, you can give them the read-only or the full access. And that's how you are tying up your FMID to your solutions. So again, these are the three key workflows that uh, FMID gets tied to. So a summary on the FMID, as I talked about already, the initial license purchase, then adding new team member, and the third is assigning FMID to your FileMaker apps. Now, as I mentioned earlier, now you under FMID, you can track everything. You can track the subscription, your license, who is using it, your solutions, your teams, apps, users. The other important thing that we are doing with FMID is protection against suspicious login attempts. So what happens is, say for example, you have multiple devices and you have logged in with FMID from multiple devices. At the back, we have a program to check whether there is any suspicious login. And we are going to send you email on that. And we got feedback on quite a few of our FBAs who had been testing the product that they really liked that feature. And one example would be like Google, Gmail. You know, when we log in from a different device, they immediately send you an email saying that they identified that device somebody has logged in. So that really helps to protect and uh, protect and the security against such uh, threats, login threats. So this is just to wrap up you know, the summary of all the features that goes behind the creation of the FMID. Next is data regulations. As we talked about data regulations uh, in our visionary keynote, we will launch in US West first, but continue adding regions globally. Canada, UK, Tokyo, Singapore, Sydney, ensuring data is available to the nearest country region wherever you are. I would also like to add that when we launch, the data will reside in US West. Now, as we keep adding regions globally, then the data becomes available in those regions. However, when we launch and say you are uh, sign up with FileMaker Cloud, your data is residing in US West. Now, you are in, in a different country, and your your, we want the move to the data in another region. We are not going to do that. But you have the option to download it and upload it as an existing customer. However, if you are a new customer, and you are, your region, say, is in Canada, and we just added the Canada data region, then your data will be available there. But if you are an existing customer who is picking up, uh, who just signed up, purchased the license for FileMaker Cloud, when we launch, then your data will always be in US. And we do comply with GDPR. We value privacy. Security and privacy is in our DNA. And, uh, and we'll follow other countries with similar regulations. And Herring is going to cover more on the security aspect when he talks about the architecture.
over to Herring. All right. Thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you very much, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, so uh, in this section, I would like to, um, to show you some of the major architectural differences between the current cloud offering, which is sometimes called Cloud 1.x, or officially uh, FileMaker Cloud for AWS, and the new cloud, which is just FileMaker Cloud or Cloud 2.0. Um, and a lot, there's, gonna be, there's going to be a lot of detail I'm going to show here, uh, but you don't have to be too worried about them. Uh, you don't have to know all the detail in order to use our uh, offering effectively. Uh, we're showing those details to you just to demonstrate that uh, first, uh, security is in our DNA, as Sangeeta said earlier, and also that uh, this new cloud is not just the repackaging of the uh, cloud 1.x. It's a total uh, uh, redesign. Uh, we basically rebuild the cloud from scratch. So let's see. Um, with cloud 1.x, I'll just use the term 1.x. This is probably a little bit uh, easier to say and to uh, a little clearer also. Um, all FileMaker do, is doing is provide you with the software bits right, in the form of a virtual machine image, or AMI. We make that machine image available uh, on Amazon Marketplace, AWS Marketplace. So you can, but it still requires you to have your own AWS account, right? So you have to sign up for AWS account yourself. You can use that AWS AMI image and uh, you select your own uh, virtual machine size and configuration, and you basically just install our software on top of your uh, EC2 instance. And um, so each of uh, so you so you're going to have uh, one EC2 instance, one uh, virtual machine instance for each of the uh, FileMaker server that you uh, are going to deploy. And um, then let's say. Uh, uh, you want to connect to, to your uh, server ABC now. So all you do is you, from Pro, you just create a connection directly to the FileMaker server. It, it's fairly simple, right, and straightforward. Um, here at FileMaker, we're supplying you with the software bits. We provide you with some of the CloudFormation templates for some of the best practices of configuring uh, uh, your installation on AWS, but there's a limit to what FileMaker can do to help you beef up your security. We can provide you with uh, knowledge base articles, with uh, some guidelines on how to do it, but uh, uh, for, ex for example, in the uh, machine image AMI, we pre configure the firewall so that it's uh, secure by default. But again, um, a lot of the security work is l largely left to you. You have to kind of figure out what else, what other measures you want to implement uh, for your installation. Now, for, for, for FileMaker Cloud 2.x, um, we have invested a tremendous amount of resource into building a lot of um, defense around, uh, around your, your server. So uh, we, let's start off with uh, FileMaker ID, which uh, Sangeeta already had mentioned. Um, this is uh, 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 based on standard uh, OAuth 2.0, based on uh, Open ID Connect standard. And uh, we also provide you with the ability to use multi-factor authentication. We have added a series of additional components and subsystems to beef up the security. We have added ability to defend against distributed uh, denial of service attacks. We have added uh, 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 content distribution networks for improved performance. We have added web application firewalls on top of the, uh, the conventional network firewalls. Because our offering, new offering, is entirely API driven. Uh, we have added uh, API Gateway. And in addition to all these 
more uh, well-known components, we have added another uh, large subsystem that will uh, ensure that only legitimate devices are allowed to connect to your FileMaker server in the cloud. So to, to get into a little more detail with that, I'm going to uh, give an example of, let's say, uh, we're trying to uh, connect uh, Pro. Pro is trying, we're going to use FileMaker Pro to connect to your FileMaker server in the cloud. Um, FileMaker Pro detects that the server you want to connect to is in the new cloud, so it will require the user to log in with FMID. And uh, once you log in with FMID, the, uh, there's a, this special entity called uh, token that will be transmitted. Uh, it's kind of a badge of, uh, 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 that certifies that this user is actually a known user by the system. And uh, this is a tamper-proof uh, token. It's an OAuth2 uh, compliant, uh, a standard compliant token that is transmitted back to FileMaker Pro. And um, as we mentioned earlier, we, uh, uh, this FileMaker ID component is, is extremely important. Uh, Sankita already mentioned that we have uh, ability to detect uh, suspicious logging attempts, and this is based on uh, machine learning. And uh, uh, so, for example, if you uh, logged in, you usually log in from Orlando, Florida, but uh, all of a sudden someone is trying to use your ID to log in from Moscow then the system will detect this and will send you email to, uh, to ask you to confirm if this is uh, actually what you want to do. And uh, now that we know this user is legit, we're also going to uh, register your device as a legitimate device to access FileMaker Cloud. And um, again, this is all the, the, that little token that we mentioned earlier is transmitted to the, through, throughout this whole process. And, you, and you're going to see that uh, it's going to play additional roles in this process. And now FileMaker Pro is going to make, uh, try to make a connection to the FileMaker server. And this is the usual Draco or TCP IP connection that you are all already familiar with. That part has not changed. What has changed is that now this connection is carrying this credential, this FMID credential with it. And um, now the FileMaker Cloud will see, okay, this is, this, is, uh, this is a connection attempt coming from a device that I already know, that I know it's legitimate, so I'll let it through. Otherwise, this connection attempt will be rejected. And this happens not only with FileMaker Pro, it happens with uh, FileMaker Go, with your data API, with your admin console, uh, basically anything you want to do to contact your FileMaker server in the cloud will have to go through all these uh, sophisticated checks to make sure that the access is legitimate. And now the same token is conveyed to your FileMaker server. And this my FileMaker server will make one final check to see if this user even though this user is legitimate for FileMaker Cloud, but is it allowed to access the application? And uh, as Sangeeta showed you previously, uh, the, uh, uh, the FileMaker IDs, the credentials, are, the access permissions are embedded in the FileMaker solution files, just like today. And so uh, uh, FileMaker server at this stage will also make that verification to make sure that the user has all the requisite permission. Now, embedded in all this, what's not very evident is that uh, what happens to the mapping between the fully qualified domain name of your FileMaker server and the actual IP address? Now, FileMaker Cloud 2.0 is a uh, fully managed uh, platform as a service. So we want to, so there, so all of the, uh, even though your, all of your, uh, all of the customers, uh, FileMaker servers have individual distinct domain names, 
if you look at the uh, DNS records, they actually all point to the same IP address uh, for, for a particular region. So let's say um, you have domain name ABC and domain name XYZ in the same uh, data center, US West Coast. They will actually all map to the same IP address. So you kind of wonder, well, if that's the case, then how would the system know, you know which one of the uh, FileMaker servers is supposed to connect to? Well, obviously, we have solved that problem. We are able to, uh, to, to infer uh, the intent of the connection. You know, uh, you, you're trying to connect to ABC, even though you're the, ultimately the IP address translates to the same IP address. We actually know the correct um, my, uh, FileMaker server to connect to. And as another um, additional feature that um, um, Sangeeta alluded to a little bit earlier is that we actually externalize the storage of your remote containers outside of your uh, FileMaker server. And the reason why we do that is that for certain kind of, uh, for interactive containers with certain type of multimedia data, we will be able to stream the content directly from AWS, bypassing FileMaker server to your Pro, to your Go. And the benefit of this is that some of the, the, the streaming of, say, audio or video can be very uh, taxing for your uh, FileMaker server. So we're basically offloading that burden from your FileMaker server so that your FileMaker server can dedicate its CPU, its storage, its memory to more important for other uh, for running the apps and other aspects of your app. So, uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, we're showing you all this detail. Doesn't mean that you have to understand all of it. This is just to show you that uh, FileMaker two dot, uh, Cloud 2.0 is a, it's a total redesign of our cloud offering. And, um, we, uh, uh, we have assembled uh, various uh, groups within FileMaker to ensure that uh, security and continuous operations is, uh, is always there. And uh, we want to emphasize that uh, this last part about cloud ops. Cloud ops, you can think of it as, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of the combination of security operations and uh, DevOps and uh, DevSecOps. So basically, the, the combination, the culmination of all the best practices for managing security, for managing continuous uh, availability, uh, but in the cloud environment. So I think that's, uh, that's an overview of the uh, architecture differences between 1.x and 2.0. Next. So we, thank you, Herring. That was great. So we are launching. <laughs> we are launching end of October this year. We're really excited about this. And in the roadmap, I'd like to share that we have working on unifying the customer console, the, the admin console and the uh, FileMaker customer console so that you have everything under the same hood. We are working on the SSO. We will support other OAuth providers, and we are also working on the migration strategy. So we are really looking forward to work with you all. We, we have invested heavily so that we can do the heavy lifting and lower your TCO so that you can get started with the FileMaker Cloud. And one other thing that I want to mention is, uh, if I want to purchase so from what are the different places that you can buy FileMaker Cloud is three places. From the store that I already showed you, from FBAs, and by calling sales. So these are the three places from where you can buy FileMaker Cloud. With that, and what Herring just showed you is, Again, reiterating the agility and speed that 
We have simplified the purchase and the deployment process. We have a big team that's working on the security and support and availability. And we want you to focus on building your apps. So lower your total cost of ownership and get started with FileMaker Cloud. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Hi, Herring. You said that uh, security is in the DNA. That's really great to hear. I can't imagine there's any scenario you haven't already thought of. But Sangeeta said something earlier in the uh, fireside chat that made a few people sad. So why aren't you going to be pursuing GovCloud? Um, we do not have, as I mentioned earlier, not in the near term, but definitely something, you know, we can take this offline, we can discuss the requirements in the future, yes. But not something in the near term. Hi, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one, in the cloud point one, uh, we don't really have the IPv6 support for mobile networks. Will the IPv6 support be native uh, for cloud version two? I beg your pardon, what, uh, what support? IPv6. Oh, IPv6. Um, uh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think it is supported. I think our uh, QA team has been testing it, but uh, let me get back to you on this. Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, the second one, uh, for, for example, for customers who have a site license, how the licensing will be different? Right, so, so the idea is that if you have, um, if you want to migrate your license to to the new cloud, you can certainly work with our sales team. Uh, you'll probably get, uh, uh, you know, reimbursed uh, reimbursement for for your uh, existing license. So, whatever time length is um, remaining, we are going to transfer that over to this cloud 2.0. Okay. Well, uh, right now we have uh, it with a site license. We have ability to spin up the cloud version one on mm -hmm. our site license. And it counts towards our site, so we're not paying anything different. So with version two, it will change? Yes, but we, we have the ability, as Herring mentioned, and we can work with you to transfer it to your uh, cloud 2.0 license. Well, in most cases, we cannot separate. We still have to have our on-site server running and like in the transition transition could take from two to three years to transition fully on cloud so how that will be handled well to running the, your server like on premises but still having the ability to have a cloud solution and uh, working in tandem between them I see. So could you, um, can you, I'll share my email address. Can you share your, and I'll go back and look into it and then get back to you. Okay. Um, next question about, you uh, mentioned that you have uh, denial of distributed mm -hmm. uh, uh, service yeah. attacks. Uh, what kind of, or what's the mechanism of uh, protecting, of protection? Right, so uh, obviously we make use of, uh, what AWS already has provided, but we also have uh, added our mechanism. Uh, some of the stuff, uh, I may get fired uh, if I talk about them. Uh, some of our design is actually uh, uh, patent pending, so uh, I cannot go into too much detail. Okay. Uh, but we, do, uh, we, we did invest a lot of research and development into that. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, FMID, very interesting. Um, two questions, one of which may not be related to this speech, so just tell me so, uh, and I'll ask that one first, which is how will FMID be handled on premise? And then second question is, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like concurrency is totally going away. Mm -hmm. Right now we have a concurrency licensing option, and I believe that's totally going away with Cloud2, is that correct? Uh, so uh, we are uh, looking into, in our next releases, uh, 
uh, how to uh, integrate FMIT into on-premise. Uh, in fact, uh, our original design is to release uh, FileMaker 18 or 19 with FMID. Uh, but uh, due to certain uh, uh, circumstances, we're revisiting that roadmap. But we do intend to, uh, to have the on-premise, uh, to have FMID uh, available for on-premise. Uh, your second question about the concurrency license. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, something, yes, it doesn't exist uh, at this time for uh, the new cloud. Uh, but uh, uh, I understand that there are certain use cases that, that could be useful. For example, if you are, say, uh, running a kiosk for, say, DevCon sign up, uh, that may become uh, uh, one valid use case. I think that's something that we need to continue the conversation with the community uh, to see how to address that. Thank what's, you. What's the uh, migration time scale uh, from version 1.0 to 2.0? Um, as Sangeeta mentioned before, we do not provide, uh, at this time, we do not have any uh, specific service to help you to do the migration on your behalf. Uh, you're always free to download the, your solution and the data and then re-upload them to uh, FileMaker 2, uh, to the Cloud 2.0. Okay, so it's not going to be an automatic process then. That is correct. Right. Okay. But we are, however, working on uh, the migration strategy as one of the roadmap, like how to help the customers. So we will be working on that. Okay. So as of now, we don't, but we will be working. All right, thank you. When you did the demo or showed the slides regarding the team member, you said they consumed one of the licenses. Mm -hmm. But as an FBA member managing mm. You know, Cloud 2.0 for my customers, I would set myself up as the team manager. They would be the billing, or I would be the billing as well. So I really shouldn't be consuming a license. Yeah. Um, so this is something we are working on right now. We did take the feedback from a couple of other partners as well. Uh -huh. So this is one of the things that as we go back, uh, we will work and get back how this is going to work for the FBAs. And so also, if I was a team manager for many servers, would that new screen show all the different servers in one place, or, or I'd have to log in? Uh, at this time, it's not a consolidated view, and I, I think some of our uh, par other partners also express a desire to have that. But uh, so right now, you will see a drop-down list of all the teams that you manage, and you can choose which team to go into to get. Uh, that's uh, that's fair to... enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and all this is API driven. All we have to do is publish the API so that you can help yourself build your own consolidated GUI. All right. If you want us to sell licenses, you got to give us some control. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thanks for your presentation, and uh, thanks for the detail. I appreciate that. Uh, so I'm an internal or in-house developer, and we have a fairly large user base. And when you were going through the invitation process to get people to get an FMID and access the server, will there be a way to tie this to Active Directory? Uh. <laughs> In the future. Right, so uh, as Sangeeta mentioned earlier on the, on the roadmap is our plan to, uh, uh, to first connect to uh, public uh, ID providers such as Google, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. uh, those providers. And we are looking to the possibility of how to, I think the, the biggest challenge is your, your AD is on-premise, right. basically, right? So the challenge is how do we connect your on-premise AD to the cloud? And that's something that we're actively uh, working on. Into. So this, uh, these, um, again, to reiterate what Herring just mentioned, these are really high priority items right now in our list, and we are actively working on that. The SSO, the other OAuth big providers, and also Active Directory. Well, uh, um, for our team, we're, we're pretty excited about what we've seen uh, over the past few days and are looking forward to testing it and seeing if we can move our solution that way. And if you can Absolutely. make this possible, it will make our lives much easier. Yes. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. you. Thank you.
Uh, you said you were uh, launching the Pymaker Cloud in the uh, end of October, but I guess that was the uh, Western USA first. True. Uh, when will the rest of the world come, <laughs> come after? <laughs> and I'm especially interested in Northern Europe. Uh, so with cloud, you know, we are moving into more of a, one of the things that I want to share is a very agile way so that we can bring up new features and add more uh, uh, launch other centers pretty quickly. So it will be soon, but I can't reveal the dates. Uh, so, but it will be pretty soon. Okay. What options will we have for support outside of normal business hours? With Cloud One, we have the ability to restart the instance manually mm -hmm. because we have access to the actual AWS account. What can you do for us to make sure that we'll have 24-7 availability for our customers with Cloud 2.0? So this is something, again, uh, it will be published when we launch the Cloud 2.0 at the end of the October. And for all the, you know, priority, high priority issues, there will be uh, like P1 issue or something going down, there will be 24 by seven support. Will we be able to contact that support directly via phone or email in the event of an issue? Yes, those are the things that we are kind of right now working on. What's the kind of access, how you can reach, uh, what are the different options you will have. So they're all getting worked on as part of the launching uh, go to market. I look forward to your answer. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm, I'm one of those um, early adopters of Cloud 1.x, One, and I've noticed uh, some significant benefits that are coming with 2.0, and also some things that appear to be going away, which I'm, 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 I want to clarify uh, if that's the case. So uh, the, the option to select your own region at the creation of an instance, is that something that's not under our control? So what will happen is when you uh, select your uh, license to information that where I showed the bill to license to as part of your purchase process. So when you do the license to, we'll pick up the closest uh, um, data center or the region and then you will be placed in that data region. So it's up, we are going to select that. It's not up to the customer. Right, that, that's kind of what I wanted to get clarified. So uh, uh, initial rollout, I think, from what you mentioned, is only on the West Coast. So, mm -hmm. so at the beginning, everyone's going to be on the Exactly, <laughs> yes. Whether they like it or not. But, but uh, later down the road, as you, as you continue to expand, if I want to deploy something, if I'm on the East Coast and I want to deploy something on the West Coast for clients who are geographically closer to the West Coast, do I, ha do I have any control over that being, or is it based on my proximity versus the client's proximity? Um, as of now, no. If I, if I understand, Herring, do you want to add something? So as of now, no. So whenever you are putting your license to, we will pick up, it will get mapped to the closest region. Mm. But uh, this is definitely one of the other feedbacks that I'm going to take in and we can you know, take that yeah, offline yeah, and look yeah, into yeah. it. Yeah, if there can be some override. The same would be with instance size. Apparently instance size is now tied to, to the, the number yes. of users. And as users increase or decrease, w w okay. If users increase, the instance size automatically sizes up. If users count goes down, will the instance size automatically go down? Uh, currently, uh, we, uh, at first launch, we do not have the option to decrease the user count. Ah, okay, all right. Um, and if I want to increase the instance size regard, uh, independent of the uh, license count for performance issues. You can do that. You can increase yes. your compute yes. right. without can, increasing the number of users. All right, but, and can I decrease as well? Uh, that, no, at this time, it's only up. It's a one-way trip, okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, just, 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 and the third one is about fully qualified domain names. It's not possible in, in 1.x in market to have your own domain name and your own top-level domain name associated with your instance. Is that going away or is that a possibility in 2.0? 
So in 2.0, uh, all of the at the uh, at the beginning, all of the customer's domain will be uh, subdomains of the FileMaker domain. Mm. Um, uh, we are uh, part of the the roadmap is to look at custom domain names. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that's something we're looking into. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, most of my questions have to, I have two or three questions, but primarily revolve around the FMIDs, and it's a big room. I hope I'm not the only person who's is confused by these, but how, uh, I'm wondering a little bit about how they tie to every user has to set up an FMID, and is this, we, our users are primarily, we have about 100 salespeople in the field, and they're salespeople after all, and now we're asking them to keep up with an FMID, and how do these tie back to account credentials for the apps? Do they have to know both to log in to any app that they want to, to get into that's hosted? Or, and do we have to set these up? Can, is there a way to set up FMIDs for users behind the scenes without them having to do that themselves, send out all these invites that we're going to get a question for every single one of them? Right. Uh, so, and then, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. And, and the second thing with FMIDs is do the apps you mentioned linking your solutions to an FMID. That seems to be primarily for a little bit of security and organizational purposes. Do we have to do that? And if so, I assume an app could be linked to multiple FMIDs. It's a lot. But. Right. So, um, first of all, uh, FileMaker Cloud 2.0, the only uh, ID mechanism or logging mechanism is FMID. Uh, in Cloud 2.0, there's no in-file uh, credentials anymore. Um, That's perfect. That's great. The, um, so the, the, the administrator of the, uh, or the team manager is the one who has to add the, uh, uh, the, the FMIDs to the, um, to the individual apps. But you don't have to do this for each of the 150 uh, uh, users that you have. Um, you could in your uh, FileMaker customer console, you could, oh, sorry, first of all, these uh, users have to sign up their own FMID. That's, we understand it's, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, our customers have to overcome, but that's basically all your users have to do. And then you, as the administrator, once you have their FMIDs, you can put all of them into uh, one or multiple groups and in each app, all you have to do is to add the groups to the apps, not the 150 uh, FMIDs. So that, you know, uh, makes your life a little bit easier, hopefully. And I, I'm assuming you can tie the groups to privilege sets. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So that you was... have all your sales team under one group, and then you can assign that to the solution. Okay. That's better than I thought it would be, and that answers my other question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In um, 1.0, you support uh, MirrorSync. And the issue that is missing um, is that as the database or the application has revision, they have to do a manual download for a new, new copy. If you're using it on AWS or a regular file micro server, it can automatically download by just changing the, changing the ID number in, in the app. So oh, you need a new copy and download it. Will they be able to get an automatic download in 2.0 through MirrorSync? Uh, a, a bigger part of download of what? The application itself. Oh, okay. Mirror, you know, when you're using MirrorSync, you've got a local copy on your iPad or your computer. When you don't have connectivity, then you come back into connectivity, it uploads the data and downloads stuff. And uh, 1.0 supports the use of MirrorSync. It does not automatically update if you've made changes to the application itself. So they have to do, you have to tell the guy, hey, download it. They click on a link and it downloads the thing, downloads to their iPad or whatever device they're using. Um, if they have a standard AWS server or a, stand, a standalone FileMaker server, they can download automatically just by changing the revision number in MirrorSync. It says, okay, hey, gets done with the sync. It says, oh, you got this new version available. Click this button and it downloads and puts a new version on their, on their device. Uh, I apologize for my ignorance about MirrorSync, but uh, uh, basically uh, Cloud 2.0 uh, 
uh, from FileMaker Server and Pro's connectivity perspective or Go's pr perspective, they're identical. So uh, what works with 1.x should work with 2.0 as well. All right, so the, the automatic update for the next version of the app itself is not it's still not going to be there. Yeah. Uh, Right. The, the, uh, the automatic updates of the, uh, of the FileMaker server is done, obviously, handled well, by FileMaker. I'm not talking about the server. I'm talking okay. about the, the app itself. The, the app itself, the file, okay. the database. I see. All right. So if you're running on AWS or a standard FileMaker server, you can, it'll automatically initiate a download if there's been an update to the database itself. And, the question, and on, on Cloud 1.0, it won't. Can I can oh, help? Sure. This guy, this guy knows all about it. The question is, in the admin API, will there be an ability to do an HTTP GET to get a copy of a file that's hosted on FileMaker Cloud? Uh, not yet. I see. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, now you have translated that into something I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, at, uh, so, so the download is still the download capability is still in the CAC console, just like in 1.x, and it's all API driven. Uh, I do not think we publicly publish the how to actually call the API to get the download, but since it's API driven, I'm sure you can figure out you can you can you know look under the cover and see how it's actually done. So, so the capability is still there, is still there. The API is identical with the 1.x API. Hi, Herring, um, I want to uh, catch up with you after this session. I got some specific questions, but I just wanted to ask the general question of what happens when, when you said that you're automatically updating the instance size and capability when you increase the number of users. Are there metrics that determine why and when and what, what's, what's the difference What's the real difference for FileMaker performance if I go from a medium to a large to an M4 large to whatever, whatever you're calling it? Is, do, is there anything published or will there be any published that says if you're doing this, you might think about going here as opposed to staying where you are or something like that? Right. So I think, sorry about the confusion, but I, I think we, we probably uh, didn't uh, communicate clearly. There is no automatic uh, scaling up of your instance size. Uh, we require the user or the team manager to still go in and say, okay, I want to increase from five users to seven users, then the instance size will adjust. But uh, it still requires, uh, you know, your intervention to, to tell the system you want to increase. D does that answer your question? <laughs> no, not really. Is, is, there any, is there anything published or will be published about FileMaker's oh, reasoning behind file, uh, instance size and what's appropriate for what situation. I see. Um, uh, that's something we could look into. Uh, right now, we, we, we do not have any plan to, uh, to, to kind of uh, give you this kind of formula. Um, so we could, we could work with you and uh, figure out what's the best way uh, for our community. Thanks. I'll, I'll bug you after the sure. session. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is actually tied to one of your previous answers. Uh, you mentioned that uh, any kind of uh, scaling changes are going to have to be managed by um, uh, the, the management of, of the console. Um, have you guys given any thought to auto scaling for things like low disk space conditions? Uh, and I, I understand, with the understanding that there are pricing considerations and how you would handle that, has it, has, is that on your roadmap at all in terms of? Um, addressing low disk space conditions or uh, low compute availability uh, um, on the fly. Yeah. yeah, you must have overheard some of our inner secret discussions, but yes, it is something that we would love to, uh, to offer our community, this uh, auto-scaling capability. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering if you could, uh, I don't see them currently on the FileMaker community site, but if you could put up the slides from this session, from yesterday's Claris Connect session, and whatever is publicly releasable from the keynote sessions, uh, so that we can, uh, so that I can update my, and brief my coworkers without having to show them grainy photographs of what, what was going on and go through my notes. It would be a lot more helpful if when we were going back and, and giving briefings, we can have the actual slides to, to use as, as tools. Sure. Sure. Thank we'll you. talk to our marketing. Yes. 
Thank you. Yes. All right, so if I understand it correctly, um, when you increase your number of users for FileMaker Cloud 2.0, you can't decrease. So what about for like seasonal things and like events and stuff like that? Uh, some of the nonprofits I work for, they might put a burst of workers on a particular event and they'll need access. So if I increase from 20 users up to 50 mm -hmm. for the next two months, then I'm stuck at 50. I can't go back to my normal 20. And a second question would be tied to that would be if my instance is connected to my user account, what about shift workers? So if I have 100 licenses, but I have um, people coming in in shifts of 25, they're not all accessing the server at the same time, so I don't need the scale for 100 users. I only need the scale for 25. Is there a way to decouple the number of licenses and let me manage my instant size on my own? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the second part, which is the easier one. The first part of the question is harder when I leave it to uh, Sangeeta to answer. Uh, so um, uh, you probably noticed during Sangeeta's presentation, uh, you can uh, make a user uh, a team manager and or a licensed user or none of the, or neither of them, right? So that basically means of your uh, 100 users, you could add all of them to your team and only, let's say you only bought uh, 20 licenses, only 20 of them need to be licensed. And as they rotate in and out of shift, you can then, uh, uh, you know, uh, move the licenses from one user to another. Obviously, for, from our sales department's perspective, we don't want you to do that. We want you to buy 100 licenses, but this is one way to, you can overcome this seasonality. So you could just stick with buying 20 user license and kind of share the license among um, a larger uh, population of users. Will there be a way to migrate solutions without the need to download everything? Uh, at this time, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the only mechanism we're recommending the users uh, to our, uh, we're recommending our customers to do is to download. We understand that, uh, and the reason why we, we say this is because from our 1.x uh, user population experience, they have, you know, on average about three or five files. So it seems to be a kind of a reasonable approach, but we would love to engage with our community to, to understand the, uh, so that we could offer a more automated migration service. I think Sorry, the first part of the question. previous... Uh, yeah. uh, Could you repeat the first part of the previous question? was about how to... Um, um, yeah, because of seasonality, yeah. you know, they, don't, they don't want to buy the annual you know, 100 licenses. This is something uh, I need to take back and talk to our sales, and uh, we can get back to you on this.